Hello, my name is Martin Searle, your Police and Crime Commissioner, and I'm here in my home address about to speak to Rod Hansen, your Chief Constable. Uh, first time I've interviewed or spoken to the Chief um, in this format, several miles apart, but we're doing our very best to practice social distancing and set a good, good example. Um, in this difficult time, it's very important that you, the public, get to hear from the Chief Constable, and I do my job in putting your questions to him. So we'll see how this works. I'm looking forward to seeing what he has to say. The questions that we'll put today are a combination of questions that I've had into my office and some the Chief Constable himself has received. So let's see how it goes. I must say before we start how impressed I am with the way the constabulary has risen to the challenge of COVID-19 and they have my full support. Well, good morning, Rod. It's great to see you. Um, difficult times, I, I appreciate that. We've got some questions here from the public and some I know have come into your office as well. Particularly people who are interested in the style of policing and the approach to the lockdown you're taking in Gloucestershire as our Chief Constable. And what instructions you're giving to your officers? Because we know there's many of them out there. What are the sort of broad instructions to your staff and your officers? Thank you. Good morning, Martin. Um, yes, so we've started to try and understand the public health guidance in the first instance and work to the spirit of that. Uh, we know that it went on to become regulations and law, but in terms of the tone and the style that we've tried to set from the beginning of our response to the COVID-19 epidemic is one of uh, policing by consent. We know that we need to maintain a strong and healthy and respected uh, relationship with the public when this is over, and we don't want anything that we do now, our behaviours or our tone or attitude, to affect uh, a good recovery, and if not, you know, ideally an enhanced relationship with the public at the end of this. So the instruction to my uh, colleagues is to be, um, you know, approachable, to uh, to apply the four E's, that is a, a fundamental part of that guidance, to initially engage with a member of the public or a group, to explain in case they don't understand what's required of them, uh, and to encourage them uh, to comply with it. And I have to say the vast majority of our encounters with the public have been positive, the public have been supportive. There's been a very mature um, and responsible approach by many, many members of the county, which I think we should be collectively proud of. That's what I hear too. I think we must recognise as a public, I count myself as a member of the public like you do. We've never dealt with anything like this before. The police have never been in a position where they've had to tell people not to be here, not to be there, apart from in public order situations. So I think the public tend to get there. Um, I think you'll be aware that some people perhaps aren't complying as they should do. What's the message to those people who you feel aren't complying? And have you seen many instances of that in the county? So it's a bit of a, a broad uh, spectrum, really. Uh, as I said, the majority of people are very compliant and they are very healthy engagements where there's lots of um, thanks between the officers and the public and it's a very positive position. Uh, as time has passed, that guidance has, m has moved towards regulations and the regulations have then turned into aspects of the law and our approach uh, has been since that adaptation is to enforce the law where we need to but police the guidance and I've talked about how we're trying to police the guidance with that balance between common sense uh, and um, legitimacy with occasional enforcement if we have to. And there's no doubt that there is, uh, a, a, you know, there have been examples of people who have flouted the law uh, and the regulations, and there have also been significant breaches. And so what we've seen now is a collection of um, uh, tactics and uh, methodologies. So it, most of it is is just encouragement. Uh, there is a, there are a category of people who have been fined, and we saw that over this weekend when the fines aspect of the legislation came into, into being and we quickly scrambled to make sure that we had our fine system in place so that we could in effect report people for summons. That it doesn't criminalise them but it gives the officer an additional discretion to be able to use fines for people that have um, disregarded it repeatedly or um, they get a real sense they're not going to comply with their reasonable instruction. So an example of that, Martin, would be over the weekend, you'll know that we were out in force on the motorways and the uh, arterial routes coming in and out of the county. That was a genuine attempt to uh, try to prevent unnecessary movement. 
We stopped over 200 vehicles last weekend and the majority were very responsive. Uh, of, you know the drivers. There were a few that um, the officers felt that they were uh, in no way um, justifying their journey. You know, 300 tr a mile trip to go and buy a car in Bristol from Manchester isn't a necessary journey. The officer felt that they, they, those individuals in the car, three men, weren't going to turn around at the next junction and go back from where they came, and so they were issued with a fine. Uh, and we've also had at the extreme end people who were flouting uh, that the law and the regulations and we've arrested them, uh, interviewed them and charged them and that's primarily when they've been using uh, the virus as a weapon and we have some examples of that as well. Rare but we will enforce the law if we have to and we have done. Thank you Rod, that seems like a very balanced approach and I think the, the public, the vast, the vast vast majority would support you in, in that position. I think across the country and certainly in this county the question which I think is put by many members of the public who are well-meaning. They're not trying to flout the law. They're not trying to find a way around it or a loophole. They just want a genuine steal on this particular question. And I think you know what it is because you've had it many times. We live in a tremendous county. It's a very green county. It's a lovely open spaces, which we really cherish. And I've had a lot of communication from very decent people say, Look, I live in an in a urban area, but just a mile down the road, an open countryside where I've walked my dog for years. I need to go there for my own well-being, my mental health. I can't see any reason why I can't do that. Can you please give me some guidance? And the majority, the vast majority, are asking because they really want to support the NHS. They want to support you, but they also want to stay sane and enjoy the county as best they can. And another one I had was from somebody who had somebody with mental health issues who being in an urban area, in a very small space, was causing significant medical issues. I won't go into detail, but just literally a mile away, there's somewhere they could go to be more tranquil. Um, I'm lucky I have a garden. Some people don't. Well, we've seen, haven't we, nationally, that the police service uh, and other agencies are trying to walk their way through uh, how to interpret uh, the emergence of the guidance into regulations and into law. And, and it is a difficult um, path to, 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 to tread. What we've tried to determine from the outset here in Gloucestershire is that we don't want to solve one problem and create another. And mental well-being is as important as physical well-being. And I'm very conscious that um, you know, if you live in an urban setting perhaps, on the fourth floor in a small studio flat, and you have a dog and you want to go and walk it and the place you normally walk it is the towpath which is two feet wide. If you go to that location you could find yourself um, swamped by other people trying to walk their dog on a two foot wide path as opposed to perhaps walking a further distance to the race course. But what if you can't get to the race course for instance to go and get some exercise? Uh, and we've tried to uh, ensure that our staff interacting with the public are uh, helpful in helping the public to understand what the right answer is. And, you know, we, we could become consumed with almost every scenario. Can I, can I have a, a skip order to my house? Or um, can I take my car out for a, a ride to test the pollen filter? And we're trying to say, to, and these are genuine examples, and I, and I feel for the public because they're trying to do the right thing more often than not, and they're ringing 101 to ask those important questions. And what we've said is, look yourself in the mirror. And what, what does your moral compass tell you, first and foremost? And if it really doesn't pass muster on an essential journey to get some exercise, you know, buying an Easter egg, perhaps, or buying a birthday card or a present is different from buying some eggs and bread. And we ought to be able to work it out ourselves, first and foremost. But where there is doubt, um, then have a conversation with us. And uh, you will know, Martin, that we, we spoke with the MPs recently in the county and there was a, a really healthy discussion about this very topic in, and we, we tried to work our way through it with your help as well. Uh, and an example was, can I go to a field to feed my horse and look after my livestock? And the answer is yes, of course you can. If you need to do that, it seems essential to me. Uh, but do it sensibly. Only travel as far as you need to. Travelling 150 miles to go for a run in, in Hyde Park is not the same as travelling a mile up the road to find an isolated wood where you can walk your dog. And so officers will use discretion based on the reasonableness of the decision making by members of the public. 
Uh, if you need to feed your livestock, of course go and feed them, but don't take four people that you don't need to take. Um, and it's that sort of um, set of examples that we've tried to use to guide the public to the best of our ability. It may not be perfect, but it feels the right it feels like the right answer in line with our style and tone that we've maintained a consistent approach on. We're seeing the NHS really stepping up and now delivering amazing services in very difficult situations. As the Chief Constable, we talked about this some time ago, how have you prepared the force for this pandemic? How, are you, how is it going? Well, can I also uh, add my uh, gratitude to our colleagues in the health, uh, health sector? They are working tremendously hard in very, very difficult and dangerous circumstances. And, you know, our job from the outset has been to play our part in supporting uh, other partners. In this case, because it's a health-led emergency, uh, it is led by, the response is led quite rightly by the Director of Public Health, Sarah Scott in the county. Uh, and we know Sarah, we've trained with her, we work with her through something called the Local Resilience Forum, which prepares for a crisis. Now, once the crisis occurs, the right lead is identified. Here it's the Public Health England Director. And we then uh, support uh, the establishment of something called a Strategic Coordinating Group which is a multi-agency approach under the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004 to help recover the county to a new normality as soon as possible. And um, initially it's in response mode, it's response to a crisis and then it's the restoration of that new normality. We're still in response mode. And um, uh, my, my Assistant Chief Constable Craig Holden, you, you'll know Craig has been the Deputy Chair of that Strategic Coordinating Group in support of, of Sarah. Uh, and we, in effect, help to support the day-to-day -day running of that SCG setup. And we have a, a Local Resilience Forum Coordinator, Matt Steele, uh, who works for the County Council doing a great job as well. There's, you know, this is the work of many people. So in answer to your question, point one, when this happened, we need to be supporting our partners, the right partners, uh, who are setting up and getting into gear to respond to a national emergency, an international emergency. Secondly, we um, and concurrently, we turned our attention to making sure that we could continue to function. Uh, if we can't answer 999 calls, 101, deal with crime, business as usual to the best of our ability, and, um, and all the things that are expected of us in our role as a, a police service, then we failed. So we became very early adopters of the guidance and we put in place very, very early on organisational distancing, shielding of very vulnerable staff. Some of our staff have significant diseases, including cancer, and they were shielded at home. Um, fast, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that they were still asking for a laptop so they could be socially useful. Tremendous effort, by the way, from our staff as well. Uh, and we put cocooning into place. Uh, I remember briefing you, Martin, that we uh, overnight had moved our response teams out of their main central location at Bound Furlong. Literally, it seemed overnight, um, they were moved into three locations, lockers, out trays, the lot, so that we could split them into three, so that if any one of them got the virus, they didn't contaminate and pass that on to, in effect, a huge chunk of our response officers. We couldn't afford for that to happen. Uh, we moved half of our major crime team out of their main office and set them up with half of the CID office uh, almost overnight again to make sure that uh, if we succumb to the virus we didn't lose entire capabilities in one fell swoop. And I think those early measures along with establishing something called a COVID-19 response team um, and that team by the way is given additional protection, additional they have additional skills and training and they would go to um, members of the public or calls where we felt for sure uh, or even suspected actually that there might be someone in that property uh, who could be showing signs and symptoms of the virus. So uh, that all helped to maintain a healthy workforce uh, to the best of our ability. I'm really pleased to say uh, that we've been improving the abstraction rate in a positive way uh, for the last week or so. It peaked <coughs> um, at one point about 10 days ago. We check it every three hours, Martin, and we know um, precisely uh, how many people are off, how many are self-isolating, how many have symptoms and how many people have to be off to be shielded for their own protection. And that is monitored through our Silver Command every three hours as I say. Uh, and we have been able to sustain an adequate workforce to do not only our job in the county as, but as a police service but to support 
the public recovery of this um, uh, significant incident. Thank you. I think that's reassuring because even though you've accepted, we all do, this is a health emergency, not a, not a police emergency, but the police must step up. And I'm aware, and I know we've discussed this, that some of your staff have been treated very badly by people, I believe, using COVID as a weapon, as a threat. And uh, I'm also aware, and I think a lot of it's the same case, but other cases in the county where the other emergency service, people in the NHS, have been very badly treated by an incredibly small minority of the public. But uh, I'm pleased that you're there, strong and resilient, to take on these people. Did you want to comment on how your staff are being protected and how you would extend that out to uh, other members of the emergency services, the ambulance drivers, the nurses, the doctors, and indeed the general public? Thank you. You, you will know that we, we, and I in particular, feel very strongly about the health and well-being of our workforce. They're magnificent people and they put themselves in harm's way every day. Uh, and I need them to come to work feeling supported and secure to the best of our ability in, at times, a very hostile environment. So we have a very well-established wellbeing programme and a supportive leadership um, culture here. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused uh, another challenge to us. And we have had instances where members of the public have been using as a weapon, coughing deliberately at uh, public sector workers, sometimes members of the public, but that includes police officers and, and some of our police staff colleagues. It is utterly unacceptable. I was very pleased to see that the regional head of the CPS recently came out with some very clear um, guidance to her staff, which she copied me into, to say that it is unacceptable and will be treated uh, with a seriousness that it deserves. And we have had a couple of instances over the last weekend where one of our special constabularies, uh, chief inspectors, was um, responding to a house party. Um, they took somebody into custody and when they got to custody, uh, they were um, spat at, the officer was bitten and punched. It is utterly unacceptable. That individual was interviewed and charged and put ideally before the courts. And we've also had um, officers uh, receiving uh, racial abuse whilst they're doing their job in relation to this. And also, of course, paramedics being coughed and spat at each time we've taken a very firm stance and quite rightly put those before the courts. The sentence is uh, a fine or 12 months in prison, but that will be for the discretion of the courts and I trust them completely to do what is right in each individual circumstance. So I think I'm right in saying a very dim view. If people who use COVID-19 as a weapon, be it racial or, or physical, by coughing or spitting, are highly likely to find themselves in the cells, locked up and before court. Is that about right? Correct. Good. I think that's a very strong message and you get my 100% support for that and, and you're quite right, the courts will deal with it if they think fit, but I think the public of Russia would expect that and that's why it's important I think we keep a very strong, strong force. Well, thank you, Rod. Thank you very much for that. I think that was really, really helpful. I certainly hope you found that useful and found that informative. You can see this on our various uh, social media channels or on our website. And uh, the important message is, please keep safe. Thank you.